So, Anthony. What's going on, buddy? Getting ready to do a little test here. Um, see if I can get a better view. Adjust my tripod here. That's a little better. There we go. All righty. Um, do a little test here. I'm working on the quills on my Evie Scallon reel here. And um, I had to stop, take a break, and throw myself into a little Bedini slash Tesla stuff here. And meaning that when you get to that make and break, connection stuff. You kind of um, have to get into the Tesla. Um, so right now, I'll, I'll go ahead and just start this. Uh, connect the battery. Connect it up and I'll talk to you about how it's working. All righty. Let's run through this process here. All right. Well, we got a wheel turning. We have uh, magnets on the outside here. And I got them all facing north out. Okay. And, um, Four magnets on there. Uh oh. Got a good time. My reach space. Always something. There it is. <clears throat> Need a little loving. So, uh, got. Magnets on the outside, four of them. They're all north facing out. They're all taped to the wheel. You got a reed switch on top of that battery. Coming out of the reed switch, so it's burning the reed switches, I'm going into a, um, a relay. And that's that tapping here. The relay, relay making connections. Basically, that, the relay is handling the load of that coil there which is turning the wheel. Let me make adjustments here. Picking up speed in here. So this battery here is only um, feeding power to the relay from the reed switch. That battery there is the prime mover, the one that's firing up the coil here. That coil there is a bi-filer. So I have um, 20 gauge wire, so 16 gauge wire and 20 gauge wire. Uh, there's 300 turns on there of each, which um, I, I, you know, I'm going to get into discussion with you guys in regards to that, because that's where the Tesla um, part of me wants to sort of treat that coil a little differently. And um, we'll get into that in a second. So we have um, battery A for the relay. Battery B is the prime mover. And battery C is the charging battery. So I started this battery, I don't know, it was at 12, 12, zero. So far it went up. 12.2 and climbing. <clears throat> now that is only being fed from the back EMF of that coil. Uh, I have uh, one diode in there because you can't connect that directly to that coil because it'll fire up that coil. And uh, so you have to put a diode in there so it's, it's like a valve. So we're just sending uh, 
it's in one direction, so it's not coming out. And um, it's kind of interesting stuff, though, because uh, that relay or that read switch, you hear that stop all of a sudden? I guess what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into tomorrow or this weekend. I'm going to set it up to where I can get this 2N3055. And we'll ditch the relay and the read switch. Because this can handle it. Uh, I think this right here. Pretty sure I wrote it down. That's uh, 15 amps, 50 volts. 115 watts. Amperage on that coil that I wound. Um, I believe that is 300 turns, 16 gauge. They're all connected together. I got to look into that because I was building that for the big wheel, but I'm just using that right now to kind of get a little better conception on how the hidden switch, hidden, hidden, hidden miss, I'll call it. Because I'll be doing that on the big wheel, and right now we're collecting back the, the half the energy. So the positive side is driving the coil, and it's putting out and wasting, I guess, energy there. But the back side of it is getting put into this battery. In case you guys wanted to know more about the transistor, you can see how here you have your base, your emitter, and your collector. And that's how it's set up with the pins. And you can hold it, that's upside down. You hold it where they're on the top side. And then to your left will be the base. And to the right would be your emitter. And the chassis itself is the collector. And these are current driven. So the flow goes from the base to the emitter. And that what drives the transistor. FYI. NTN.
So should still be charging plus a load. So you have your relay battery. You switch your relays running off of that. That battery there is your prime mover. That's running the coil. That coils the bi filer. And this here is a charging battery. Go ahead and hook up a house battery, or uh, a house uh, light bulb, Marissa. Let's see if anything happens to the bulb. I'm not connected to anything there yet. Let me go ahead and connect that battery back up. You can see it dropping back down to two one. Let's see if we can handle this load as well as that's really good for a house light bulb lighting up off of this system here. Let me grab uh Got this screwed, work the barons a little bit so they're nice and smooth. Got four magnets. They're north facing out. And it's running the whole thing, guys. So I just let it go. It's going to reverse it and see which way. Twenty volt light bulb, fluorescent bulb. Oh. 
Also, I have that on. That battery right there is a load. Well, William, um, what's happening? Um, the aluminum on the rim, um, something I, I want to bring to you guys' attention. Let me get some more light in here. I want to go over with you in, in regards to dipoles, but I do need a compass. Where or oh, where has the compass gone? There it is. The compass. Let me check it to make sure it still goes the north, true north. Yep. All right. guys off of the phone and stop the wheel. So we're going to check to check the magnetic field and why it says south I have there you go north. See how it says south in the middle and then we're back to north. South north. It's got me thinking. It's got me really thinking. So all of these are, are, are facing north up, okay? All four of these magnets. This is aluminum rim. Now, not the spokes, they're iron or the steel. This is aluminum. So I believe, like, uh, with uh, Lathwaite, his experiments with the... Um, with the magnetic river. He talks about levitating a train across the aluminum when it's induced by a electromagnetic field. Well, here you go, guys. So you have the same thing happening here where the electromagnetic field on the this coil here um, induces into the aluminum. Uh, let me stop this thing for a second. And in between the North Pole, it becomes a dipole. Now think about this. You have a North, a North, and you have a, a positive in, the, in, in, the, in between them because the aluminum. So the whole array itself, 
blast out electromagnetism all through the aluminum rim because of the reaction of what's going on when it gets over to the coil. So this coil is not only just firing on here, but it's also blasting on the aluminum. So it's really got me thinking even more because this is north heading out as well. So this is, this is an experiment to see how if we're just pushing now, instead of using magnets to pull, because magnets, what's going on, David? So the uh, magnets are always pulling. And this is like a whole different, a whole different thing. This is using magnets to push now. So by having this be a, a, a North Pole, having the magnet be a North Pole, and already by themselves, when there's no, when this is not connected, this, let me disconnect the battery. So there you go. So what's going to happen here is the magnet's going to get, see how it locks itself in? So there's always a pull going on with positive and negative, with a, with a dipole. And, the, and, and this is pretty much, you know, a good lesson to learn why your opposites attract. You have here a piece of iron that the magnet is attracting itself to. So that all of a sudden puts the opposite pole in front of it from the lens law effect. So you'll have this is north. It's creating a south right now in the iron itself. But once we go ahead and connect the circuit up, now you can see now it's pushing it away. It's no longer going to stick now. So there's something, this is the reason I had to take a little break here for a second. One is I have to, before I go buy a lot of wire, I want to know exactly, exactly how I'm, 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 I'm taking it through the, the next layer, the next level. This here really helps me a lot because, well, one, to turn the wheel, you can see that we can turn the wheel. And all you got to do is, is really know how to turn it. So, we obviously can get this turning. Same principle, nothing really changes. A lot more mass, a lot heavier. Yep, that's a, that lights the back EMF, and that's hooked up just to a house light bulb. We're also charging this battery over here. I got a dioid coming off of that. And it's coming in here. It seems not to be going up because I think we're sucked in the juice to like this battery. But um, you can't connect the battery right to that coil because it'll do just what the primary coil is doing at the bipolar because um, it'll charge it. So you have to put a diode in there. So basically, this pulse will work its way in and, and, and the juice can't come back out. So you're kind of throwing water in the tank. And you're charging this battery. So back to what we're talking about, guys. We get comments, man. I don't think you guys talk too much. We should be talking to each other. Um, uh, now we're about pushing. So we're pushing. So it got me thinking a lot. And I said to myself, well, you can already see how dipoles work. And you can see Mother Nature in hurricanes and typhoons, uh, they spin opposite directions, and it got me thinking that the North Pole to the equator is a dipole, and from the equator to the South Pole is another dipole, and what they call the Watch Wall is like the center of of, of the. I guess the center plate of of the dipole, the compressed area. There's got to be two poles there. Left, right hand rule. Yeah, with the with the hurricane. So, with that being said, that means there has to be a pole reversal, just like on these coils here, left, right. So I only have two wires sticking up. And we're going to put the tape that gets the positive, this side gets the negative. Well, that takes the coil or the magnet or the iron, whatever you want to say, and 
you you pull facing you become the pole that you want based on how you turn it. Like for instance this one here is going counter to that south, that's north, that's south, and the yellow is the south, so you can verify it. And just by winding. So let's look into electrostatics right now, because right now we're dealing with electromagnetism. We're taking the back EMF. And I didn't even go into this, or I, I want to go deeper, because what's fascinating about this is that we're got a bipolar. One side, the thicker wire, is getting the juice to, uh, and you design the coil on how much current you want, and that current will provide the back end. Now, I guess the less current, the, the smaller the back end. So you design your coil. Uh, Accordingly, how much you want to get. Now, if you have one coil and then you have all of a sudden you got a ray like I have here, this will be 24 coils going around, providing a back in that. So, whatever I can study, design, and create will be 24 times what I'm able to do just a of one coil here with a semi uh, uh, knowledge of the coil, how this would be the best, what would be the best coil. Now, if you look up some of, of uh, the work of Bendini and uh, Johnson, and you look to see they're, they're using thin wire, and to me, you are not going to get your current through your thin wire. But you do need resistance built in. So easy fix there, add a resistor. But as well as if you had thicker wire, and what I don't think Bedini, John Bedini, or Johnson ever said in any of their videos or writings, is they don't think you would assume that both lengths of the bifiler or trifiler or quadfiler. Or, or Ocho fire uh, file that S8, I think, uh, is different in length. And I think that's what you do because you deal with frequency. I think that's how I'm looking at this. That I take that coil and now I'm looking at it differently. I got all my components and now I focus in and hone in on that coil. And that coil to me is similar of what I read back when Tesla was showing off his radio controlled boat. And I haven't seen any video from it, but I've read numerous different magazines and newspaper clippings from back in the day. So I'm going to look them up. And, and, and I only can imagine that the coil, the primary coil, just like his vertical Tesla coil, has a primary and a secondary. And he also has a reward clip, he has a tickler. So the tickler in there would be the, the feedback, the, the uh, trigger wire. So if something has to be notified to click on and off, such as this, you would have your trigger wire. So here, now I'm saying, okay, I'm honing in on my coil because this coil needs to be what I put around here in the best of the best of the best. This is too expensive of a, of a, of a ray here to be buying a bunch of shitty wire and screwing up. So far, I'm digging into on how your primary of a Tesla coil, usually I use quarter inch thick primary, uh, and it's usually 50 feet. And when you're tapping on that 50 feet, if this was the wire going around, you, you know, it depends on how much capacitance you have, that you, you would either be closer or further away. So usually about five or six rings out. So you're probably 20 feet out. And you're working around to, to match the primary firing uh, to the secondary's uh, reactance of the collapse. So basically, the primary fires, the secondary um, takes that back EMF on the collapse, runs off the secondary, blasts 
pushed out the top of the top loader down to the ground. And then the process starts over. So the coil here to me is not even set up right because I should be looking to tune my primary coil to my secondary coil. So if I want a lot of voltage coming out of my secondary coil and I don't need a lot of current, I can go ahead and use thinner wire, 30 gauge, 36 gauge, and I can use more turns, 900, 1200 turns. It's usually where I am with a secondary or a tesser coil, and I'm about 50 feet in primary wire. So I don't need 300 turns of primary wire, but I should be taking the primary wire and going up and such. Guys, leave your comments. Um, we'll break all this down in the segments because these are just a good, I love to see things turning. And to see that this is a solid mechanism here that's taken, that's yeah, not connected, that's taken the back half or whatever it takes for that, like, like the positive side of that battery is going, using for work, and the reactance of it, which is the back EMF, sort of usually gets thrown in the ground. So you can actually think about how much energy in your house. Of everything you use, the other half just got thrown away. What the hell? Who does that shit? Why, are we, why didn't we design a system that saves that back half and bounces, bounces it back like a damn ping pong? Where you get the other half back. I don't know, you do something with it. If you're not using it right away, it's got to keep moving. Or you, you put it in the capacitor, it becomes static. If you separate the charges, it becomes static. Very important stuff, guys. I, I wish I could actually talk to you guys all night. Uh, there's so much here that I want to dig into here and kind of everything I mentioned, kind of like cool little segment. But yes, you know, and, and then I didn't mention this, but Tesla coils don't have iron inside. So, <laughs> real quick, so you know, and you probably already know, if you, if you work in any ham radios, um, you can adjust, you have a little coil and it, uh, it looks like 12 gauge wire with about 12 turns. And it's got a little uh, ferrite core that it slides in in between it. And the more it slides in, the slower the frequency. So it slows the frequency down. So the frequency with it out in there is, is doing its normal. As soon as you put it in there, it creates an electromagnetic drag. You guys know about electromagnetic drag. It'd be the same thing as if is if I come up to this wheel with a magnet that has a strong pole that's going to attract it, that would be electromagnetic drag. So you see that going on, which is phenomenal. All of this is phenomenal. the house light off. Now this is uh, four and a half watts. Takes 12 volts. right there. Not a lot, but I can put a couple of them on and, and keep rolling with it. Let's see if you guys can see that up there. Can you see 
can be generated off the side of this right connector. I'm going to go ahead and bang that out. I might get that done over the weekend. And we'll have two types of energy that we're dealing with. And uh, that is so cool in itself. Well, I'm glad I'm not epileptic. These flashing lights probably be screwing me up. So, I, I don't want to get into putting any more up there, but that's nine watts right there, power. Back EMF. Guess I can do a couple more. Nine watts. Killed the second one. Now I disconnect the third one. Or it blew it out. you think it blew it out?
So you got your electromagnetic, you got your electrostatic, and we talked about dipoles, where dipoles are things that can be created anywhere, like underground, above ground, and you can use them in all different kinds of ways. I can't wait to get the electrostatic introduced over here. And we're talking 400,000 volts at least, 200 to 400,000, no joke kind of stuff. But it's how the ground reacts. So we'll have to get some rubber boots and we're going to get the ground energized. That's uh, right this second. Right now you got you got back EMF. You got half the energy that it takes to make this function happen. So when people talk about like zero point energy or or uh, or uh, over unity or uh, I guess I guess you have to look at the basics here. What are you really looking at? Regardless of what makes the motion, if the motion creates the energy, then power in, power out. Now, according to Einstein, theory of relativity is you cannot get more out of what you put in. And according to some of my friends I talk to, is you don't get free energy because it has to take energy to get it back. Here's where I think electrostatic come into play. Because electrostatic is what I said earlier. It's 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 energy that's not moving. It's 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 stuck. It's on a plate or it's in a a capacitor in an environment where it's stuck. But one thing I'll tell you, that capacitor, when it's charged and got a lot of pressure on it, 70% pressure, let's just say, at 30% uh, less than being filled, you, you have something that's capable of making whatever amount of current all in that in that capacitive pressure in the release of it the storage of it and the rate of change so that's where the electrostatics in my mind come into play and that's how you connect to the ground that pipe i have right there um, it's just a pipe in the ground, but to me, when I did it seven years ago, not knowing anything at all, not saying I know anything right now, but I feel I still don't know shit, and I look back at my videos a month ago, and I'm like, wow, why didn't I know that? And I just kind of beat myself now, but... But I put the pipe in, and I always looked at it as it was like a car battery where it had one pole sticking up. And I never called the pole negative, never called it positive. Once you get to learn about clouds, um, it, it's a good way to, to know how the ground reacts to the cloud, how the cloud, whatever charge is at the bottom, the ground will react to that uh, electromagnetic presence and the electrostatics take over. So it all starts from electromagnetic because the, the charge at the bottom of the cloud and the charge at the top of the surface of the ground. Ground's predominantly always uh, negative. Why is that? Where's the positive? It's just below the negative. 
to just keep themselves that segregated in different areas underneath there. There's caverns, there's water, there's a lot of air spaces and tunnels underneath the ground. It's not just solid. So with all that air and all that stuff in there, gives places for dive holes. Hear me out. Dive holes could be important. So there's dive holes coming everywhere. So when the when the ground when the center is releasing energy out, the energy is running side by side, all all is one energy until it, it's able to separate itself. And obviously that's done by cooling down, so you can't make a magnet hot. And so cooling down, and then it's able to separate. So it becomes one when it's molten, I guess. And the charges in the ground, at least from the surface, down, I think, 80 feet around the whole world. I think the, the, number, the number one product in the ground is aluminum. Nobody talks about that. Aluminum. So if you look at some of the levitation devices out there, the ground already has aluminum plate. You follow me? Already has its powder. You can activate that through electrostatic. Now think about how these levitators work, to where they're using AC and DC. The same thing. Open up your mind while I'm doing the video. All right, you guys. Yeah, we, I call it reverberate, and the, the reverberation in the ground is the air pockets and the little chambers, and that's why I thought if 